Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Guilty as Charge podcast presented by Prize Picks. My name is Steven, and I'm the host, as always. And joining me is my guy, Tyler. Tyler, what's up, man? How are you doing today? Been better. Uh, I've also been around better weather, but you know what? We push on. Yeah, it's been uh, raining up here, raining down there. Uh, certainly not raining as bad up here in Fresno as it is down in like San Diego and all that. I saw some friends who were down at the Pebble Beach golf tournament and they are not able to leave. So, because uh, of the weather. So, uh, hopefully, everybody down south is uh, staying safe. Hopefully, the weather is not too bad for you. Um, and uh, at least it's raining sometimes, you know. Got to spin it a little positive, you know. My first winter here, it like rained like once. And uh, the mm. next following summer was really, really bad. So, yeah. You know, better to rain sometimes than ever. Yeah. that That's wow. Put that in a. Put that in a- <laughs> I think that's in Soon Zoo's Art of War somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, we have a, a few things to get into today uh, in terms of the coaching staff. We were hoping for some official, like, like <laughs> finalized news. We haven't gotten it yet, um, although it is still 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Um, and that weather has canceled a lot of flights. So who knows? Maybe the, the, the news is, is still to be determined. Um, Joe Ortiz's uh, introductory press conference is tomorrow, so I would imagine we'll get something before then. Uh, but in the meantime, we have a lot of links to the Chargers and their coaching staff, a lot of potential confirmations, well, a couple of confirmations um, that we're going to dive into today. Tomorrow, we are going to record with the Chargers um, and do a uh, reaction to Mr. Ortiz's press conference as Chargers GM. And then we'll be live on Thursday for uh, our other episode this week. So uh, just some scheduling news there. As always, please like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff, um, as you guys all are so great at doing every single week. That being said, I I think it's only right that we start today's news uh, with the special teams front. Uh, Mr. Jay Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh's son, is going to be the special teams coordinator for the Seattle Seahawks, reuniting with his old friend Mike McDonald. Presumably, and most likely, this means that Mr. Ryan Ficken is going to be retained by Jim Harbaugh, which is fantastic news for the Chargers special teams unit. We've raved about Ryan Ficken on the show uh, several times, and and deservedly so. Um, But I want to get your take on this, Tyler, in terms of what it means from a Jim Harbaugh standpoint, because he very could have easily booted out Ryan Ficken and hired his son, and he's not doing that. What do you think it says about Jim Harbaugh and his willingness to retain Ryan Ficken in in this role? That he's not an idiot. I mean, (laughs) we said before the cycle, any head coach who walks in and goes, yeah, we should move on from Ryan Ficken, should just be shown the door. And look, Jay Harbaugh might have come in and done a really, really good job. They might have even been top 10. Ryan Ficken had that team top five, sometimes first in the entire NFL, working you know, in a cave with a box of scraps be able to take this special teams unit and instantly make them better. Now, of course, they had some help, you know, uh, finding Cameron Dicker, having Dustin Hopkins, Josh Harris, sure, credit to Telesco and all of them for assembling, you know, what would be a good special teams unit. But no, I I think it's, I think it's great for, for the fans, obviously. I think it's great for the team. I think it's smart of Harbaugh because there was no other better option. And even someone, again, even if Jay Harbaugh, was a really good special teams coordinator in college and maybe another or there's another coordinator out there another option out there from a good special teams unit like you don't know for sure with Ficken, you know for sure and i just think it helps so much the development of players on special teams is strong if michigan if mentor if ortiz if they're all about player development ryan ficken's a part of that too mm-hmm. and now i think that you know i think you should have gotten some head coach interviews as is Now sticking around with Harbaugh for another year, if they stick around and have a really good special teams unit again, I think you potentially could get a special teams like, or excuse me, a head coach job next year because of working with Harbaugh and with how you know pretty good I think the Chargers will be overall. So smart move. Uh, It was the obvious move, but one I really was not sure about. Um, We'll talk about some other moves, but I mean this is this was the right move. There's nothing else about it. Like this was the right move. It was the smart move. It's the safe move. It was the best move, and I'm happy. Yeah, man, it, it's a it's a great move for the Chargers. And I think one of the things that was always said about Jim Harbaugh is like he knows how to build a coaching staff. He has that eye for 
high-end coaching talent and he's able to you know identify coordinators at a, at a really high level um i mean his son is going to be a special teams coordinator in the nfl and he's choosing to keep brian ficken i think it says a lot a about ryan ficken and b about jim harbaugh's you know opinion of ryan ficken in, in a short time it must have made quite an impression on him and i can't say i, I blame him i mean the numbers speak for themselves but ryan ficken is is even at the press conferences when he's talking about special teams, like I could listen to him talk about special team stuff all day. And he's, he's just a, objectively a great coach. I think you look at his track record with the chargers and it's not like he has these all pro caliber players to, to work with from the, from the start. I mean, he had JK Scott and Josh Harris. Those were his guys that he picked, you know, Deandre Carter was his, his return specialist and he was a good punt returner and a, and a below average kick returner, but it's not like he was a great – it's not like he was Cordero Patterson or Devin Hester or whatever the case may be. And then kicker-wise, Dustin Hopkins gets hurt, and then you have to do the whole, like, practice squad kicker thing, and then finally you get to Cameron Dicker. And there was some, like, legitimate concern if Cameron Dicker could be able to be a long-term kicker, and then he gets a full off season as the guy in partial, partially due to Dustin Hopkins' injury, and Cameron Dicker turns in the best season in Chargers history in terms of a kicker. And, you know, the, the Chargers finished third in the league in special teams DVA this year, which is like <laughs> we always joked, you know, the line of like, just get us to like the 20s and we'll be happy. The, the, Ryan Ficken had them third overall. And like, you know, all of you listening, like think about the, the terrible special teams history that this franchise has endured. And Ryan Ficken has been able to not just turn it into an average unit turned into a legit weapon. I mean, they won at least two games this year because of special teams, that being the Jets and the Patriots. And now you're going to be able to pair that special teams unit with what Jesse Minter is going to bring from a defensive perspective. Uh, obviously, has not been confirmed officially. Um, and then what Jim Harbaugh and whoever he hires on offense are going to be able to do. Like the Chargers could have like legitimately like complementary football to a T going forward because of a guy like Ryan Ficken. Yeah, it's it's incredible that Ryan Ficken, the entire organization was overhauled, I'm assuming, presumably, if you will. Yeah. I'm presuming that the entire organization is going to be overhauled. To have 99% of your coworkers be let go or fired, or they move on, or you go elsewhere, to be the last man standing is really impressive. I'm curious then how much of the other parts of the staff, Ryan Ficken, or not Ryan Ficken, well, sort of, uh, that J Jim Harbaugh would retain would like Chris Gold stick around as mm -hmm. assistant special teams coach, especially because like that maybe could have been Jay Harbaugh, maybe not the coordinator, but okay, the the special teams uh, assistant kind of guy. So does Chris Gold stick around? Um, so yeah, very 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 curious how that works out. And then it's it's I don't know apples and oranges I guess, but does Ed Ed McGuire stick around? Does JoJo Wooden stick around? Do some of these guys that are being held over through the pre draft process? And the draft process, do they stick around? Because obviously we've heard Jim Harbaugh mention Ed McGuire. So because at least one individual is sticking around, are there more? And who are those people? Yeah, I mean, I, I it sounds like Ed McGuire is going to stick around. It sounds like, you know, he's probably closer to retiring anyway. Um, you know, I, I forget who said it. I want to say it was it uh it might have been like Robert Mays on the Athletic Football Show, show podcast, but They've mentioned that, you know, the um, the season for front office folks goes until after the draft. And that's kind of like their, you know, that's when front office changes mostly happen. So Joe Ortiz is bringing in, obviously, the analytics manager with him. Um, but I don't think that we'll have a ton of change in that regard. But in terms of the coaching staff, like all of the key pieces, all of like the high end coaches that were on the Chargers roster they're all already finding other jobs. I mean, Giff Smith is, you know, got a, a deserving promotion with the Rams. I mean, uh, Kevin Coger, Kellen Moore, obviously, Doug Musmeyer. These guys are all gone. Chris Beatty's with the Bears now. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with Derek Anzi. I know he's gonna, not going to be the defensive coordinator, but maybe does he want to stick around for, like, secondary position, although that is kind of a demotion. So we'll see what happens with some of these other assistants, but it does sound like J uh, Jim Harbaugh is going to want to kind of overhaul things. Um, but Ryan Ficken, I think deservedly is sticking around. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously very exciting news about Ryan Ficken. 
Um, the Chargers special teams unit is uh, it, it's going to be fun to see them. You know, there's no position battles in that regard next year. Everybody's kind of set in stone. Hopefully, the, you know, they can build on the season from Darius Davis, Cameron Dicker. Um, and obviously, Josh Harris is, is Josh Harris at this point. So very exciting news there. On the offensive coordinator front, it, the reporting around Greg Roman is extremely weird. Um, nobody really knows, I feel like, what position he's going to be. The only thing is that we know he's going to be on the coaching staff by all accounts. Um, you have, you know, the wording by Aaron Wilson has been weird from the jump. Um, there was a report from Jeremy Fowler where he went in and like edited that he's presumably the offensive coordinator. There was a report from a Raven Sports Illustrated writer that Greg Roman was going to be a senior offensive assistant. Um, Ian Rappaport said he's just going to have a prominent role, not specifically the offensive coordinator. Very, very strange. Um, where are you at with Greg Roman and where do you think he ultimately ends up in, in terms of the position on the charter staff? Yeah, it's so frustrating. Uh, the wording is so weird. And they'll say, <laughs> you know, even Aaron Wilson will say in every report, you know, mentor DC, thick yes. and special teams coordinator, and Greg Roman something. Like, there's no, like, no one wants to commit to what that role actually is. And if they do, they end up changing it. So Jeremy Fowler sent. A lot of Chargers fans into a tailspin yesterday. <laughs> I'm definitely not as against it as some. You know, I joked that some fans would rather Greg Roman be like the tight end for this team than call plays on offense. I'm not to that point where I'm just like, it cannot be Greg Roman. But I, I won't pretend to be all in and excited that like, oh, yeah, Greg Roman, Justin Herbert, the pass game. Woo. You know, that's not really going to be the case. But that isn't the case with Greg Roman. Anyway, this is about the run game. This is about the blocking. These are about the sort of things that the Chargers lacked last year. The Chargers got one out of three things right last year, I think, in the, the passing attack. But they broke down in protection. They broke down in the run game. And that is, A, the reason that Herbert got hurt, and B, the reason that they weren't as good on offense. Um, injuries as well, of course. So you're going to get a lot of good things with Greg Roman for sure. The question is, can then Jim Harbaugh and some of the other guys we're going to talk about, are they going to be able to round out the staff well enough to make sure the pass game is also going well too? Again, Herbert, you know, I, I think, I hope Chargers fans get the, like, I, I think they, I hope you guys get the nuance. If we just post a stat or a number about the previous, like, you know, 49ers offense, Michigan's offense, Greg Roman's offense, like, Yes, I don't think we need to explain every time that Justin Herbert is a different quarterback than these guys. But I think the offense will be better. The question then becomes, okay, how does the run game get better? How does the does Justin Herbert run more? Is he used as much as Lamar Jackson was? Yeah, that sort of thing. So I'm curious how that goes. One, the one thing I I would point out, I don't know how this has changed over the NFL over the last decade or so. But Jim Harbaugh never had a run game coordinator or pass game coordinator with the 49ers. It was Greg Roman, and then everyone had a position coach, a couple of offensive assistants. Yeah. But there was never a true pass game coordinator or run game coordinator. So the fact that purportedly, and it seems to be the case, they're going to get both a pass game and a run game coordinator is very different. So I'm curious if he has a plan for those individuals to supplement where Greg Roman is not great. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk about those individuals being Mark, Marcus Brady and Andy Bish, Bischoff, I think is how you say it, um, who are the confirmed hires there. So, um, in in terms of Greg Roman, I'm not against it. Like, I, I think that there is a ton of negativity out there that, like, I would rather have, like, you know, general fan bases, like, I would rather have, you know, people X or whatever. Like, there are people talking about like Cliff having Cliff Kingsbury instead of Greg Roman. I'm like, that's a stretch. <laughs> And also Cliff Kingsbury runs the polar opposite system than Greg Roman does. I think you look at Greg Roman and ideally for me, like I would prefer him to be like a run game coordinator, associate head coach kind of role. Um, because like his run game is, is like genuinely one of the best run games in the league. I mean, you look at what he was able to do across his entire tenure in terms of NFL offensive coordinator. And, and I went and looked at this, um, you know, his rushing attack has essentially been, you know, top five in EPA per rush and top five in success rate in five of his six seasons outside of San Francisco. 
Um, you know, obviously that's including the Lamar Jackson MVP year. That's including his years with Tyrod Taylor. Um, his run games were actually not – his best run games were not in San Francisco with Jim Harbaugh. They were after Jim Harbaugh, which I think he does deserve credit for as a coach where he can say, hey, you know what? Like I was in this situation with Jim Harbaugh. He's like my mentor, like whatever. But I left Jim Harbaugh and I – like what I was good at, I became better at. And my teams were consistently in the top five in rushing attack in terms of epa per play epa per rush excuse me success rate yards per game all that good stuff the the run game under greg roman has never been the issue the issues have always been the passing game and the lack of evolution in in that particular regard and i think i would have some questions because you look at greg roman's offenses and they're really based off of that run game and then they're based off of like a deep shot play action game and the NFL meta of defense right now is like built off of taking away those deep play action shots. And so I would have a question of like, okay, Greg Roman, like your, 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 your staple of the run game will still be able to exist. Like we'll run the football, but how do you compensate the lack of deep shots because of what NFL teams are doing to you? And I think that is something that he began to really struggle with in Baltimore. Um, and you can make a comparison about quarterbacks, stuff like that. I happen to think Lamar Jackson is a much better quarterback than uh, the consensus on social media appears to be. Um, <laughs> but it's just like it, it's just a question. Like I, I think he does deserve credit for the run game, obviously, but it, it's just a question mark. Where how, what's the next step here? Is there a next step? And if not, that would give me pause of like making him the offensive coordinator because this is. Justin Herbert, we're talking about. Like, this is a guy who wants to take that next step in terms of, you know, elevating his play and he wants to be mentally pushed. And, like, would Justin Herbert be okay in just like a simplified passing attack that just complements the run game? I don't really know. I don't know if that plays to his strengths. And ultimately, as we've discussed, Justin Herbert is the most important person on the Chargers roster right now. And, and I think part of whoever is the offensive coordinator is maximizing Justin Herbert. And I just would have question marks if, if Greg, Greg Roman is the right guy for that job. I would be curious how much they trust Justin Herbert to not handle it on his own, but kind of handle it on his own. How many yeah. different checks, how many different, how much freedom does he have with this offense to incorporate what kind of he wants, what he's comfortable with, add the certain things that he's seen. I mean, at this point, he's learned from three different offensive coordinators. Can he take from what he's pulled and learned from over the past few years in the NFL, can that be incorporated in? We saw so much of a, an independent and you know uh, mature Justin Herbert last year in a way that we never saw before. And I think I'd be more concerned from like the 2022 season if we got uh, Greg Roman in the 2023 season. But to his credit, like Kellen Moore did allow Justin Herbert to have a lot more freedom, and he had no center in front of him after the third game. No, well, respectfully, no Corey Lindsley in front of him after the third game. Yeah. And so I'm curious how much freedom there is for Justin Herbert to be able to say, okay, great. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the support. I like these concepts. We have these concepts. These work totally cool with all these, you know, certain things that you have. Now here's kind of the flavor that I'd like to bring into this. That's, I don't know if that's coping. I don't know if that's me reaching here, but we did see a much more mature, independent Justin Herbert last year. So does he have some of the freedom himself to, change some certain things and maybe the way that rivers would you know as keenan Allen has joked flip rivers would hear a call and go no nah, we're not doing that and basically <laughs> just call his own thing yeah uh, so i don't know if herbert has that quote unquote like disrespectful like nature to him sure. he'd be like no no shot we're not doing that but i'm curious if there's enough of herbert's influence on this offense for the past game actually takes care of itself a bit more I think that's fair. And I think we have seen him take a step forward in, in that regard in terms of like advocating for himself and like advocating for the ideas and things that he wants to do. Um, you know, handling the passing offense, like it's, I think obviously you trust Justin Herbert to elevate the passing offense, but at the end of the day, like we saw what happens if like you remove a couple pieces from that passing offense, what does it happen? Like what happens? And then at the end of the day, it's the offensive coordinator's job to elevate the passing attack and elevate the wide receivers and elevate the quarterback. And not that you need to elevate much from Justin Herbert, but when things are not ideal around Justin from a personnel standpoint, the offensive coordinator needs to be able to step in and say, Hey, like, let's try these new things. Let's scheme up on these touches here. 
And that's an issue with Greg Roman. Again, I think we can have a, a middle ground conversation here because of what he can do from a run game. And I am very excited about like the potential of, of adding him into the run game council, if you will. Um, but the pass game, I, I would be concerned about some of that maybe could be offset and we can get into this now is Marcus Brady. Yeah. And for my Tom Pelissero and uh, Albert Breer, I believe as the passing game coordinator. Um, I, I think this is an interesting move. It's not one that I would necessarily, so he, uh, peg to him as like an offensive coordinator type, even though that's what he, they initially interviewed him for. Um, he's been a, a senior offensive assistant with the Eagles recently. So he has been kind of brought up most recently in kind of like the Steichen and Sirianni world. He worked with Frank Reich and then he, he got his coaching start under Mark Tressman in the CFL who runs, who ran a West coast stuff. So if you go back to, Herbert's like the start of his career, the offense that they ran under Shane Steichen, there is a lot of overlap between like what the Chargers were running then and what Marcus Brady has come up under. So that is maybe a potential reason why the Chargers are interested in Marcus Brady is to get that kind of marriage of the run game and the pass game that Kellen Moore was trying to get last season. So maybe this the lack of passing game is kind of offset by Marcus Brady coming in here and his experience with what Justin Herbert likes to run. But I just, I don't know if I trust Marcus Brady to have that much of a say in the passing game to overcompensate for Greg Roman's weaknesses in terms of the pass game. And that's kind of where I'm at. I was hoping for some pass game coordinator or a more pass oriented offensive coordinator with Greg Roman as the, you know, run game coordinator or whatever offensive line coach. Technically, that could sort of still be the case, but it's tough to judge an individual off of two years, a couple years ago, as the offensive coordinator for a team that didn't really have the quarterback, sort of trying to transition between them. But even just looking at the numbers, like the best they were, you know, in 2021, 17th in dropback EPA, 19th in success rate, 30th yeah. in pass protection. Then the following year, 31st in dropback EPA, 25th in success rate. 24th in pass blocking like that's that's not really what i was at least statistically that's not what i was hoping to balance out what could be greg roman as the offensive coordinator but i'm not going to dive all in and judge this move based off of six yeah. numbers that i could pull from a data website like let's go in and watch the film see what they're up against see what they're able to do and then kind of judge from there but as of right now that pairing which i think was really really important here, however they decided to do it it's not the most inspiring on the surface level yeah and i think that's where i'm at as well i don't think it would be bad moves and again we don't know what position greg roman is going to hold it could be associate head coach and that's it it could be offensive coordinator if it's offensive coordinator marcus brady is passing game coordinator i'm not like thrilled with it but i'm not like oh my gosh this is terrible like you know this is the the charge offense is going to stink next year at the end of the day, like you trust Jim Harbaugh to run Jim Harbaugh's offense and be able to install the the exact system and culture and mentality that he wants to have. And he does have obviously a lot of experience working with Greg Roman and, and he, Greg Roman would know what he wants to run and know the style that he wants to play with. And then you have Justin Herbert. The fit with Justin Herbert is just a little quirky to me. <laughs> I would like Tyler said earlier, I would have loved a more pass a more modern passing game coordinator to come over as offensive coordinator. I think it's just easier to supplement that with a run game coordinator as, instead of the other way around. So it is just a little underwhelming, I guess, but not the end of the world. I, I think people are pointing this as a, way too negatively as they should be. Yeah. And again, we don't know what the vision is. Maybe between the three of these individuals, which again, is very different than what Jim Harbaugh had before. He's never had two you know, run game coordinator, pass game coordinator before maybe there is a, a blending of this and alignment that can work and fit what the chargers what jim harbaugh wants the chargers to do so i i will say right now it's fine it doesn't make me cheer and jump up and down it kind of feels like hiring joe lombardi not in the same kind of concepts but in the same kind of like all it's right his friend he knows who what he wants to run kind of stuff yeah 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 totally and, and then we kind of know what to expect hope for more but we kind of get what to expect it's not like, wow, we're the, the next offensive coordinator of the future is here, you know? 
Um, I, like, I don't think Greg Roman is getting a head coaching job um, for a bit, you know, so he's here to stay for a while, which maybe is a good thing too. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no more rotating that. play callers for a little bit if Greg Roman's OC. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yay. So there's, there's that, I guess. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Apparently on Wikipedia page, it says that Greg Roman is the running backs coach which I don't think he's ever done. So Greg, for those who don't know, Greg Roman has primarily come up an offensive line and tight ends. That's his bag um, in terms of his individual position coaching. Um, so that that's another thing too, is I do trust like Jim Harbaugh, Greg Roman, whoever the offensive line coach is. I know there's like a rumor out there, but nothing's been officially confirmed there. Um, I do trust this group to get the Chargers offensive line right. But yeah, I, I, I would be pretty surprised if Greg Roman is just the running backs coach. Yeah. Um, what was the question? Hold on. Not exactly the exact same, you know, question I'm, I'm going to pose here, but people are basically saying, okay, well, now that it's let, let's assume Greg Roman and they have the new tight ends coach, pass game coordinator, run game coordinator, and given Greg Roman and everything the Chargers might do with this offense, it, it does feel very Brock Bowersy, no? Yeah, I agree, and I think it's. You know, I think it feels that way. And I know that people love neighbors. It, to me, it feels like neighbors and Roman Dunze are in a very similar grade in terms of like how the league views them. And there's a lot of respected film based draft analysts that have Odunze higher than neighbors. You know, down there, Jeremiah, Dane Brugler, a bunch of these guys have Odunze higher than neighbors. So I know everybody loves neighbors. Neighbors is a weird fit in this offense to me. Um, so honestly, like I, I feel like it's going to come down to Odunze or Bowers, honestly. Um, and I, I tend to value Bowers more, and I tend to think that this regime would also va value Neighbors more, or excuse me, uh, Bowers more because of his ability to play tight end, block yards after catch, everything like that. If you look at the Jim Harbaugh offense, there's they've always had. Uh, a tight end that they can feed targets to and feature. It's not just like they can just throw whoever in there. Like they, they need a feature tight end one. And the only way you're getting that this offseason is Brock Bowers. Like you're not signing mm -hmm. a guy in free agency that can be a legit tight end one. You know, you can bring back Gerald Everett. He's not a legit tight end one as we've seen over the past couple of years. The only way you are getting a tight end, tight end one that you can legit feature in your offense is drafting Brock Bowers. And I think that mm -hmm. is going to be a goal of this offense is to find a way to do that. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, we'll get to some of these. I think there were some other super chats. Uh, Josh Alberson, thanks for helping me pass <laughs> hours at work. Appreciate Josh in there. Um, and then Brian, I, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but uh, super sticker here. And then the question that you just posed, so. I don't know if he had a second one or not, but um, that's what I wanted. To, I saw that earlier. Yeah. As Tyler Billings points out, the wiki page has changed his position a lot. Yes, he's been <laughs> everything the last few yeah. years in, because, because it is a publicly editable sort of uh, site. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Last thing here. Um, the, the Chargers have uh, are not have officially, but they are going to presumably hire Andy Bischoff to be their tight ends coach and run game coordinator. Um, he was with the Baltimore Ravens and Greg Roman for several years in Baltimore. Um, the last two years he spent in New York coaching the Giants tight ends. Previously before that, he was the Houston Texans uh, tight ends coach. So um, pretty diverse resume in terms of backgrounds, but um, adding an, a run game coordinator, like Tyler said, I feel like we can know that Greg Roman is either offensive coordinator or like something else <laughs> uh, because Marcus Brady is the pass game coordinator. Andy Bischoff is the run game coordinator and uh, we'll kind of see how it goes from there. I definitely feel that this it's a leap, but it could be, and I'm hoping for it. This is like the Frank Smith hire from a couple of years ago. Although Frank Smith did coach offensive line, he was offensive line run game coordinator um, he'll be run game coordinator tight ends, but I'm hoping for something like that because that would help the Chargers tremendously. And then I'm very curious. Hold on, I'm about to sneeze. All right, I'm back. Uh, I am curious if Tyrod Taylor as a backup is at all in play Ooh. here for the Chargers, given um, the Ravens drafted him. 
given that um, Bischoff has been with Tyrod Taylor in Houston. And then now, of course, last year with the Giants. I'm not saying this is why you, you bring in Bischoff by any means. Yeah. But I am curious with what we saw from Easton Stick, what we saw from what we've seen from the Chargers when Herbert's not in there. Would they invest significant money into a backup quarterback? Now, Tyrod Taylor also might get a bag that's too big for the Chargers to be able to pay for yeah. this offseason. But I am curious if they'd pay that premium because it is worth it to have that backup quarterback. And Tyrod Taylor um, is a good one. Yeah, and I think specifically you would you would want a backup who can run. Like and that can be Easton Stick for sure. But obviously the regime that drafted Easton Stick is no longer here. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens there. But there there's a couple uh free agent backup quarterbacks tied to Greg Roman. Obviously, my guy uh Tyler Huntley is available as well. Um, he has a Pro Bowl to his name, so maybe he might be a little expensive, but I don't know. Um, no, that's an interesting point though, and I think Annie Bischoff seems like a guy who's who has come up in the right way. He's been able to, you know, learn around some of the the premium teams in the league. And I think his experience in like power run game is obviously a, 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 another kind of alignment point here. So I, I think from a run game standpoint, it's very clear what Jim Harbaugh is going to want to do. You know, he's he's hiring a potential OC with power run game roots. He's hiring Marcus Brady, who's been around the Colts as well as the Eagles power run game. Andy Bischoff has been around the Ravens, the the Texans, and now the Giants in their power run game. So it's pretty clear that uh, alignment from a run game philosophy is very important to Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the difference between him and Frank Smith is that Frank Smith had like Jared Cook with the Raiders make the Pro Bowl. Yeah. Uh, I think Jordan Aikens with the Texans while he was there as the tight ends coach, I think he had like 250 yards. <laughs> so fair. <laughs> Very it's different. Got, Daniel Bellinger had a good rookie season last year. Yeah, also 250 yards the last couple of years. So, wow. which is fine. Like as a late, like seventh round yeah. pick, that like it's pretty good. You know, yeah. you could. Hey, <laughs> we've seen tight ends taking the third round have fewer than 250 yards. I would have loved for certain tight ends on this roster to have 250 yards. Um, do you buy any of this then? I was going to bring with, that up too. With, yeah. with uh, Saquon Barkley, one because of what was mentioned by Ryan Leaf, and two because well, now we have the uh, guy from the Giants. Yeah, so for those who missed it, uh, Ryan Leaf was on Good Morning Football, and he and Jim Harbaugh are apparently great friends still to this day. Um, obviously, Jim Harbaugh was brought in to be Ryan Leaf's backup and then started over him because Ryan Leaf was not ready uh, to start at that point. And uh, he was saying that Jim Harbaugh wants Saquon Barkley. Like, he's heard specifically from Jim that he wants Saquon Barkley. Um, and then, obviously, the Giants tight end coach is coming over, so... We'll see. I don't know if the, the tight ends coach really means anything. I think if Jim Harbaugh wants Saquon Barkley, I think he's going to get Saquon Barkley. The question is, do the Chargers have a way to actually pull that off financially? Steven's coughing or he's choking. I don't know. Or he's dying. Um, so what, what Steven's basically saying, his body is saying don't pay running backs. Bad <laughs> so I think that was the, the spirit of Arjun showing up there. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm I'm not anti pay running back. I they have to be the right running back, though, I think. And I'm I don't know if Saquon is that guy. I, I point I posted some statistics about uh you know the running back market and these free agent guys who you know are, are up for potential contracts. And I think with Saquon, it's a way to uh gain an advantage in terms of explosive run plays like he he is still that guy who can create explosive runs at a pretty high rate um i just question like his down to down efficiency after his injury he is going to be 27 in a few days i think so you're really only getting one year out of saquon where he before he hits the 28 year wall from the running backs um i is that satire from arjun is that real that can't be real. That can't be real. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call you again, buddy. Uh, I definitely, yeah. I, I, if that's true, I'm fascinated to hear what Arjun thinks there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Arjun's been in New York for too long. Uh, NSN, by the way, would sell his bedroom for Jackson Powers Johnson. So not quite the full it. house, but at least the bedroom, a little spare bedroom. Yeah. I get it. I mean, if you live in a certain part of town, that's a very valuable bedroom. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, the Chargers are going to sign a free agent running back. I I just, I question how 
smart it would be financially to invest the limited resources you have in a guy like Saquon because Saquon, you think you would think that he costs at least like 11, 12 million dollars per year. Like that was what he was making last year. Um, to get in to leave the Giants, I think you would have to pay more than that. So I just, I just question if they actually have the resources for that. I mean, they could, this could be a, they could blow up three of the big four and just say, Hey, okay, we're gonna take all that money. Sorry, definitely was satire from Archer. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, but that, that was what I wasn't sure. Yeah. I, I think for me, like you're looking at like a, a cheap, like Gus Edwards contract, you know, Zach Moss, Deontay Foreman kind of player. And then you draft a running back who you could potentially see being like an RB1 later on. So uh, ideally for me, you're, you're getting kind of like a bigger power back and then like a third down pass catcher explosive option to pair with that guy. Whether that happens in the draft or free agency, I don't necessarily care. If they want to go pay for DeAndre Swift and then draft a power back, I'm cool with that. Uh, if they want to sign Devin Singletary and then draft a power back, I'm cool with that. Or if they want to do it the other way around. But I, I think with the money that this team is going to have, paying $12 million for Saquon or Derrick Henry is just not really how I would like to see that money spent. Oh, I should have had it up in front of me, but Arjun or maybe you pointed out the number, the amount of money that Ortiz has paid, or not the Ortiz, but the Ravens have paid for a running back. Arjun, yeah. And Did it was, it? Uh, no, I have to find it, or Arjun can say it out in the chat. Basically, uh, the Ravens rarely paid for a running back. Here we go. The biggest running back contract Joe Ortiz ever handed out as director of player personnel in Baltimore was three years, $5 million APY with $6.4 million inflated to 2023, whatever that means, uh, to Mark Ingram, despite Lamar being on a rookie deal. So hopefully he continues that in Los Angeles, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the biggest deal, three years, $5 million APY. Yeah. I can definitely understand why any fan or Jim Harbaugh would want Saquon Barkley, but that's why Joe Ortiz is here to say that, hey, man, we don't really have that kind of money right now floating around. Um, again, you could certainly mess with the contract and add void years and things like that. But, um, you know, I tend to think that like a cheap one or two year deal on somebody and then you draft somebody in the third, fourth round. I think that's where you kind of want to live at in the running back room. And then next year, if you want to spend on a free agent running back when you have more cap space, I think that's that's totally fine. Yep. Um. All right. Any other thoughts here, Tyler? Or do you want to take some questions or? Yeah, let's take some questions. And All like right. I said, as soon as we end, the, they will drop news on the hires. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, all right. So we'll, we'll take some questions here. Uh, if you guys have anything pressing that you want to ask us, um, go for it. And uh, Super Chat's always appreciated. I do want to get your... Actually, we'll save that one for another time. But uh, I was going to ask him a draft question, but we'll, we'll save it. No, ask me a draft question. Or like, uh, what, what was the topic? Well, just because Jeremy Fowler sent out a, a story that the Minnesota Vikings are potentially going to look at trading up in the first round to get a quarterback. So you would be looking at going from five to 11 and potentially getting a future first rounder, but also possibly passing on one of these premium pass catching weapons to add to Justin Herbert. Um. Only because, in theory, Odinze could be there, but also Brian Thomas Jr. and other defensive players, maybe even an offensive tackle. I'm warming up more and more to the idea of trading out of the top 10. I get it. Bowers would be amazing. I'm still kind of there overall. But I, I, I really do like the idea of trading out, like everybody does. But I'm, I'm certainly warming up to it more. And if they decide to do that because it's better to have the two first rounders or whatever else they acquire next year. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know who's in the first round next year. I couldn't tell you. I could barely even <laughs> tell you this year who's in the first round. Yeah. Uh, let alone next season. So, you know, if Jim Harbaugh says, Hey, we got, we let's save it up for our real actual run because we're going to be all sort of in, in 2025, 2026. Those are our two big years. Then I'd get it. I'd honestly get it. Yeah, I think I, I've said this before. I think the goal for Ortiz on draft weekend is to make at least 10 selections with the way that this roster is is built. You got to get to 10. So they have their own seven. 
they're getting a seventh round compensatory pick for Drew Tranquil. I don't know if that's been talked about, but that's uh, happening according to over the cap. Mm-hmm. So they have eight. They're going to make eight selections. I think you got to get to 10 somehow. You can obviously trade some players. Maybe you can trade back in the draft, but 10, I think, is the goal. So I went into Pro Football Focus's simulator before this and was trying to look at what it would take in order to get that future first round pick from the Minnesota Vikings. The trade that I ultimately ended up settling on was the Chargers sending their number five this year and a fifth round pick next year to the Vikings in return for uh, pick number 11, a fourth rounder next year's first and a third round pick next year. So es- essentially you get yeah. the future first and two fourth round picks is how I kind of looked at that. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't mind that. I don't think the Vikings are also going to be like great. They could yeah. be good. Like I think they'll, I think they'll be good, but I don't think they're going to be great. So that that's a you know mid first rounder probably, and yeah the the funny thing I, I've been going through and you know I shared the sheet with you and we'll talk about this for you know uh, free agent option options connections to Ortiz connection to Harbaugh. I mean looking through the the Ravens trade history even since 2011. I mean it is it's active. <laughs> it's so active. It's, like yeah. I I want to double check this is all correct because I started in 2011. And I made it to 2020, and I don't think I'm done with 2020 yet. And the Ravens have, let's see, 44 different moves, uh, transactions in terms of trading picks, trading players, or whatever. And yeah. it's it's always in almost every single year, we trade back, we trade up, we trade back, we trade up. Like there's always a, an ebb and flow to this. Like yeah. they're just kind of jockeying position to get into that right spot. So, um, yeah, I, I'd be very curious. It's it's. It's such an active group, and there's a, there's a trend in here that's interesting, but I'll save that for another time. Yeah, and we're going to do like a lot more extensive draft conversations, but since Jeremy Fowler brought it up this week, I figured we'd discuss it today. Um, I, I was trying on the simulator to see if I could get the future first and two third-round picks, hmm. but the simulator would have never accept that kind of offer. You would have had, like, I would have had to give like a fourth-rounder to get that done. Um, if you wanted to just do trade back to 11 you could get a second round pick in this upcoming draft and a second round pick in the next draft so you could do that but i would tend to value the future first round pick more um but it it is a curious thing obviously this would require Jaden daniels being on the board at number five i I can't imagine the the vikings trade up six spots in the draft for bo nix or jj mccarthy or whoever yeah um but Jaden daniels could also go at pick number three the vikings could trade up to number three like it's it's an interesting scenario, but I don't know how realistic it is. You know, if Jaden Daniels is is taken at number three, that they can still trade down to eleven. Yeah, uh, well, listen, I'm just hoping Jim Harbaugh's right that JJ McCarthy is going to be one in this class. <laughs> hey, man, if four quarterbacks go first, that would be fantastic Ooh. for the Chargers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm all for that. I, yeah, whatever like hit pieces I need to send out there or start typing up, like let me just warm back up <laughs> and add some uh, character concern pieces. Yeah. Hey, you know, we we can be that unnamed NFL evaluator that people reference when they're talking about Drake May falling past the top 10. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. He doesn't love football and no one went to his birthday party. (laughs) And and apparently, if you're a big, tall head coach, uh, NFL personal people are scared of you. That was the funniest thing, man. There's like, I I had to reread that quote like three times. I'm like, excuse me? Um yeah, so Mike Vrabel apparently is too large of a human being to be a coach <laughs> in the NFL in 2024. Like he's, I've got a shot, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you break. he's not even that big. He's like six three and like two fifty. Right. I, <laughs> I don't understand what we're doing here. Um, yeah, I don't know. That that was a whole thing. So a GM saying, "Well, well, maybe he's too tall or too big." I mean, come on. Uh, another super chatting here from Nature's Calls podcast. He says that this year's draft is considered better than next. I would acquire picks in this draft. 11, second, fourth, and 25, third is enough for me. Great draft for our holes. Hmm. Great draft for our holes. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to the rest of that. Um, I yeah. think people say that, but like it's it's february 5th 2024 like i think it's extremely premature to look at next year's draft and say that this draft is better than next year's draft 
yeah, who knows? I mean, it was Joe Burrow? What was his what was Joe Burrow's projection before his final year? It was like a like, fourth round pick. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I mean, now that would take an entire class of people doing that sort of thing. Yeah. So I don't know. Like I I understand that like you need more younger players this year, and I'm not necessarily against that trade idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I would rather have two first round picks next year than two second round picks or whatever. I just think having being able to have 2025 kind of be your your full like you took your lumps in 2024 you didn't sign enough you didn't sign that many free agents like being able to have upwards of 60 70 million dollars in cap space and two first round picks next year like that's like your launching pad to like say like okay we're contending in 2025 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i saw a question here fudge i lost it sorry Oh, and I just want to ask you about all the, the players and the, the prospects, hmm. but no, I will wait. Yeah, I I watched a lot of draft film this weekend. Nice. I started to zero in on some center prospects, so that's fun mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. me. I love watching centers, obviously, as a former center. But let's see how many I'm at. Uh, I have, I think, like four. 40 players graded now Ooh, yeah I, maybe maybe 45 good for you man i haven't even watched with all these coaching staff things and blah 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 like i'm so caught up with the free agent stuff yeah and uh a lot of work there everybody go watch your your chris wormley film who is that exactly go walk, go watch your chris wormley film guys yeah I know. And uh, things changed. Like we were all like loving the idea of Jackson Powers Johnson or like Quinion Mitchell at 37. Yeah. And now those guys are like <laughs> no brainer first round picks because of what happened in the senior bowl. So, yeah, I guess never say never, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Tyler, any other thoughts before we head out for tonight? Um, honestly, no, I'm just waiting for some official news. I was really hoping <laughs> One thing would drop. I can't wait for more faux news about Greg Roman. I don't know. I don't think they would ask Joe Ortiz that question, but I'm hoping there is something clarified tomorrow. So I guess we'll react to it when it happens, whatever that is. Maybe he is their tight end. I don't know. It, I wish someone would just commit. And it's, it does sound like Aaron Wilson is finally attaching offensive coordinator to his name. And there's been. Like I, I can't imagine there's a surprise hire. There's been no other, like, it's not like there's other candidates they've brought in, and then also Greg Roman is going to be the guy. Like it's just been Greg Roman. Yeah, I don't think they've even hired, like interviewed a single other person except Greg Roman. So, uh, yeah, we'll just wait. And then I guess you look like uh, Drew Doty from the Kings. I I don't know who that is. I will take your word for it and Google mm-hmm. it. Or are you googling it right now? Oh yeah. No, now we another we another Steven look alike. <laughs> okay, first of all, the first picture I see of him is missing teeth. So <laughs> I am not missing teeth. That's good. Okay, so here we go. Let me Yeah. I'm gonna show you all screen. right. Do you want me to show you? Okay, all right. Um I will this show you. This is a great way to end the show. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we ever end the show like a normal like <laughs> we always just like all right. Um Chrome tab, Drew Doty. Okay, here we go, buddy. What? <laughs> the, Not the, at the, all. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, you have a I dark have a beard, beard but... and dark hair, and you're white. At so least he, at least this one is white, I will say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I could see it. I actually... If you look at okay, I don't know. Hold on, don't move. Hold on, I gotta look at Steven for a second here. All right, I'm, I'm... okay. All right, what are we? What are we doing right now? Okay, that was Steven. Okay, I had, had a good good look at Steven there. All right, oh, I'm bringing this back up. All right, here we go. Um, sure. Yeah, why not? I'm, I'm saying no. <laughs> I'm saying no. Okay. Uh, chat, you decide. That's how we'll close things out today. <laughs> Someone says definitely can see it besides the teeth. All right. 
Yeah, look, I uh, I only is get he a Young good hockey Ku. player. Yeah. I get like Young Hui Ku and that's it. So <laughs> Steven's you, way NSN. better looking. There I you go. Appreciate it. That's my that's, guy. That's my wow, guy. look at that. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. I I when the first picture I saw he was missing three teeth. I'm like, oh well, I, I don't know about that one. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, he's very good. All right. At least he's a good at least he's a good player. I I, I get it. Yeah. And white, unlike the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> I know that people really let you slide on that one for a bit. It was such a good comparison. People let you slide on on those comparisons. Yeah, yeah. Although 100%. you didn't make them. No. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Says I have nice hair. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um. Okay. All right. So, like I said, uh, we are going to record tomorrow on the Chargers channel. We'll have our uh, post Joe Ortiz press conference thoughts there. Hopefully we get some great insight. I've been watching a ton of Joe Ortiz press conferences. I'm actually very excited about this. I think I'm more excited for this one than I was the the Jim Harbaugh stuff in terms of like actual like content things to talk about because I think we'll get pretty some specific uh, answers from Joe that we can talk about draft strategy, free agent strategy, all that stuff. I think should be a lot of fun. So that is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, for those who missed it, streaming on the Chargers channel um and uh pretty excited about that one so that will be out on wednesday and then we'll be back here on thursday uh for another show after that so appreciate you guys for tuning in like i mentioned make sure to like subscribe comment all that good stuff really helps grow the show we appreciate you guys and as always bolt up